technical difficulties, but we're gonna we're gonna get rolling. Uh, so I'm Anna Cohen Rosenblum. I am an assistant professor uh, at, and a specialist in adult reconstruction at Louisiana State University in New Orleans. I'm also a uh, the chair of the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society Education Committee and involved in the AUKUS or American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons Young Orthoplasty Group as well. And I am so excited to um, come today to bring you a collaboration between RJOS and WIA or the Women in Orthoplasty uh, Committee of AUKUS uh, for this first of a series of three webinars about uh, get, applying getting into fellowship and practice management. So very excited to get started. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Liz Clagg. Uh, Dr. Clagg is uh, originally from Fairview Park, Ohio. She attended Ohio State University for her undergraduate and then graduated summa cum laude with a degree in biological sciences and a minor in psychology. The, she then attended um, the Ohio State University College of Medicine, where she was a member of uh, AOA and graduated magna cum laude, and then uh, did her orthopedic surgery res residency at Henry Ford uh, in Detroit. And she's currently um, an adult recon fellow in Vanderbilt. So very accomplished and very excited for her to kick us off tonight uh, for some really great advice and mentorship upon, about preparing for fellowship. So let's take it away. All right, thank you for such a nice introduction. Um, hopefully we'll get, uh, we'll get some video working for you guys by the panel, but um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we put this together and I, we started with this talk since I know there's people here from kind of all stages of residency to give you some advice on things you can do um, starting from day one of fellowship uh, to help prepare, or sorry, from day one of intern year to help get you on the path to fellowship and also um, giving you some general advice on choosing a subspecialty and then uh, a general approach to the fourth year application process since I know some of you are in the midst of that right now. So um, in general, an intern year, obviously you are learning to be a doctor and that's the most important thing. And that's uh, takes up a lot of your time. But, you know, even though you maybe are, don't know too much about orthopedics quite yet, you can still start to build yourself a good reputation. Uh, and that's going to be important, you know, down the line, if you've shown that from the beginning that you're reliable and you work hard and you, you know, you don't complain, you get the job done, people are going to be really happy to write you, you know, mentor you and write you good letters of recommendation down the road. Um, so it, your first impression will count on that. And then keep an open mind on every rotation. You never know um, what you're gonna learn and what you might find out about yourself. I didn't go into the same field that um, I thought I would when I started residency. So some people do change their mind. And then uh, also get involved in some research. If you're interested in multiple things, maybe get involved in a, a, a couple projects in each area. And if you have um, really high aspirations for big name academic places, that might be more important. And we can touch on that more in the panel. Um, you know, you might have to be a little bit more productive. So that might be something to think about um, if you know that going in. Uh, second year, you want to continue exploring different subspecialties through your rotations, um, build relationships with potential mentors and sponsors. So if you've not heard the difference between those two terms, a mentor is someone who teaches you, and then a sponsor is someone who kind of goes to bat for you, puts your name out for things, helps you network. Uh, and sometimes those are the same person, but often they're not. So uh, it's important to have both of those people on your side um, going through this process. You want to follow through with some research projects so you can show that you get the job done and maybe even start to narrow down your, your list of subspecialties. Third year, of course, is the final year to prepare um, for the application process. You want to finalize your subspecialty choice and, and identify those mentors and sponsors, and you can, you know, be frank and ask them to help uh, mentor you through the process. You want to complete some research projects so that you can put that on your CV and start your personal statement because that's something that I think is good to pick away at bit by bit. Um, if you can attend some conferences and courses to network. And then uh, by the end of the academic year, you should ask for your letters of recommendation just to give the writers plenty of notice. So in the summer of fourth year, um, recommend beginning to work on your application as early as possible, just because it can be very tedious uh, and you have to input a lot of information. So doing it in bit by bit makes it a little bit uh, more bearable. Uh, have someone else proofread everything, proofread your whole application, your CV, your personal statements to make sure it's correct. Uh, and definitely keep working hard on your rotations. You never know who might be able to help you network, um, even from other subspecialties. Um, send reminders to your letter writers regularly. You know, these can be further apart early on. And then as it gets closer, I would send them more frequently just to make sure they're in on time. 
Um, submit your application earlier rather than later. Just you want to have it off your plate. You don't want to be getting down to the wire uh, and just you know, get it in so you can relax for a little bit and then focus on your interviews and begin to think about what you want in a fellowship, like what factors are most important to you. We can talk about some more of those factors um, as we go along, but um, that'll help you narrow down which programs to apply to and then um, how help you with the interview process and then plan for more courses or conferences for networking. In the fall, you'll start to get your interview invitations. And this is very similar to um, what the process you're familiar with from applying to residency. You wanna keep, uh, keep on top of it, keep an up-to-date calendar so you don't double book yourself on accident. Uh, prepare for your interviews. Uh, these are again, very similar residency, but a lot more relaxed. So um, you're not, you know, you don't have to be as stressed out. Um, it's a little bit more just trying to get to know people and, and get a feel for the program. And then think about how you're going to keep track of all the information. So this is just a screenshot of my Excel spreadsheet that I use with like the important factors to me. And this is only like half of the columns that I had, but I uh, took notes in this app, you know, after every interview. And then I referenced it when I was making my rank list at the end of the year. Um, in the winter, you'll do your interviews. And then, like I said, relax, get to know the attendings. Definitely um, spend a lot of time talking to the current fellows because they're going to give you the most accurate idea of, of what the program is really like. Um, you want to take excellent notes like in the spreadsheet as I showed you and then think about how each program aligns with what you're looking for and your goals. And then finally in the spring you're going to make your rank list. Um, and here I think it's important to use the guidance of a trusted mentor, someone who knows you, what your goals are, how you learn. Um, I found that really helpful that, um, you know, to go through the different fellowships and have a mentor tell me, you know, this one will give you what you need as a learner and this one probably won't. And, um, and then I think once you've got your list, you want, you, you can have someone reach out to your top one or two places on your behalf, just to let them know that you're ranking them one or two or at the top of their list. Um, and ideally they have some connection there. I think that always helps, but a cold call is not, you know, out of the ordinary and then, you know, have your successful match. So um, thank you. And uh, please ask questions in the Q&A in the chat and um, we'll get to them with the, uh, with the uh, panel. And then I'm going to, I'm also giving the next talk. So you have a few more minutes of listening to me. Um, and so as Dr. Cohen Rosenblum mentioned, I am an adult reconstruction fellow at Vanderbilt. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about adult reconstruction as a career for women. So um, talk about why you need to consider it, um, some reasons why, you know, you might be a total joint surgeon, some of the reasons why I chose it, and then also some myth busters about the common, the reasons women sometimes uh, are dissuaded from the specialty and why you shouldn't, you know, why you shouldn't count it out. So why you should consider recon, you know, we make up only 2% of arthroplasty surgeons. I believe that's, that's the most, one of the most recent numbers, um, such a small proportion. And we know that the diversity of providers um, oh, uh, sorry. All right. Hey, um, the diversity of providers help improves care of our diverse patient population. And this extends, you know, beyond gender diversity. That's one piece of the puzzle. And, um, but an important one, and some patients really want a female surgeon and may have trouble finding one. And that might be because they are a female, or it may be because, uh, for cultural reasons, or they maybe have seen some of the research that women have better outcomes, uh, or, you know, they just know that we're a little bit more compassionate, and a little bit more understanding. So we just really need to improve um, the access to arthroplasty for all of our patients. So um, some of the reasons that uh, joints stood out to me. So um, if you, you know, if you enjoy the nuance of primary cases, you might be a joint surgeon. So a lot of people feel like all knees, all hips, they're the same. But if you think, oh, you know, this one balanced a little bit differently, then, you know, maybe you're a joint surgeon. Um, if you look forward to the challenge and complexity of revision cases. So a lot of people don't enjoy those because they're long and they're hard cases. But if you think they're really interesting and you like the big open cases and, and you like figuring those, how to put those pieces back together, I think that's, you know, that's a sign that you might be a joint surgeon. If you appreciate the science, um, materials, corrosion wear, again, a lot of people think that's really boring. I don't, I think that's really interesting. Um, so if you think that that's the case, you know, maybe you should consider joints. And then um, if you love seeing predictable outcomes in, in your patients and rapid improvement and quality of life, you know, joints, you know, total hip and total knee replacement have really great patient satisfaction rates. They're kind of the best surgeries in orthopedics in that respect. And total hip is second in all of medicine only to cataracts. All right. 
myth busters. You have to be tall and strong to do joints. So um, there, that's my uh, residency class. And I'm the second one from the left. So I was the shortest person in my class and that's me in heels. So I'm obviously not tall and I'm the only one that went into joints. So, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. Um, but, you know, I think really ergonomics is becoming such an important thing for everyone. And it's really about, you know, how you use your body to your advantage, whether that's standing on some steps or lowering the table or using your, your uh, assistant um, the right way. But uh, this is really a lot of male surgeons and female surgeons alike are starting to focus on this. And there was a great symposium at our AUKUS annual meeting last year on workplace safety, and they covered musculoskeletal injuries. And, you know, no one wants to, you know, be out of work at 50 because your rotator cuffs are worn out. So um, everyone's trying to, to figure out ways to work smarter and not harder. And I think that's great. And I've learned a lot of tips about how to do that from, you know, my residency attendings and now my fellowship attendings. Another myth, bone cement is teratogenic. So um, a lot of those studies were really old and done with like crazy high exposures to rats. They're way above the normal occupational exposures. So um, this review article, I highly recommend reading for any of you who maybe plan to start a family um, because it talks about a lot of important stuff. But the new research, newer research, although this is a few years old now, but um, uh, the, this study was great. It, they um, had a couple arthroplasty surgeons that did surgery without hoods on and then tested their breast milk and their serum and they had no detectable levels of methyl methacrylate. So just know a lot of us out there have have used cement while pregnant and have not had any issues and a lot and you should do your own um, search of the literature and make your own informed decision, of course, but you know, a lot of us have our own anecdotal evidence. This is my six month old um, and she is practically perfect in every way. And I cemented through all three trimesters. So um, definitely, definitely is something that hopefully shouldn't dissuade you. Another myth, I can't find mentors in arthroplasty. So this one, it can be a little more challenging, but they are out there. You know, I, we do still occasionally see people say, you know, or women say I, the male attendings at my program said that I can't do joints and my heart really goes out to you. Uh, because that's really tough, but um, had, you know, hopefully those are becoming fewer and further between. I had some great mentors at my institution that were all males, and they were really helpful um, in this process. I think female surgeons and other specialties can still be helpful in just giving you general advice. Um, and then if you do want to talk to a female recon mentor, but you don't have one at your institution, both WIA and RJOS have mentorship databases, and they can set you up with someone. And I think you know that's something you should definitely consider um, doing if you just want to talk to someone about your thoughts and any questions that you might have. Um, and then, of course, if you're interested in arthroplasty, definitely join WIA so you can be on the list and get informed about all the events. You can just search how to join and there's a form to fill out and you can attend a lot of great educational and networking events. And then, if, you know, thank you. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, if I can help you in any way at all. But with that note, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Felicity Fisk, who um, is originally from New Orleans, and she went to undergrad at University of Virginia, and then uh, medical school and a master's uh, at uh, Tulane. And then she was my co-resident at Henry Ford in Detroit. And now she is doing a spine fellowship at University of Colorado in Denver, and she is just crushing it. So um, she's going to give an, an, our next talk on uh, spine as a career for women. All right, guys, I need you to just bear with me for a second because I got a new computer and there's some thing and it's gonna, I just gotta quit and I'll be right on. I'm really sorry, I should have, I had to scrub out to do this. So I, um, I should have given myself more time. I'll be right back. Well, so while we're waiting, I can add that we're in the process um, as part of WIA and AUKUS of trying to work out some more evidence-based guidance about cement and other occupational hazards um, in the OR. So that's coming down the pike because it is confusing. There's a lot of uh, differing information out there. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. That's really important.
Hmm? Not sure if we can hear you. Right. Yeah, Felicity, we can't hear you if you're talking. All right, I think Felicity, if you want to stop sharing while you work out your technical difficulties, I'm going to go to the next one. I think I just need you to stop sharing your screen. Okay, can y'all hear me now? Oh yeah. Oh. All right, yeah, I just, I guess the AirPods weren't working, so. Um, okay, sorry, so sorry about that. Um, I gave a really great talk just then uh, that y'all missed, so really sorry about that. Um, but I am here to talk to you today about um, Spine as a Career for Women. Uh, I'm Felicity, I am currently uh, one of the two Spine Fellows at the University of Colorado. Um, I had to scrub out to uh, come and join this. So it's a very busy uh, career for you, but I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, some of the things that I think might be barriers to women being in it and like uh, things that I think that are important, worth noting. Um, in terms of some stats, uh, in 2016, the AAMC, um, well, every two to four years, they put out these big reports. They found that um, out of all orthopedic spine surgeons, that's both private, academic, all types of, practice types, 5% um, of them are female. Uh, Post it all, did a little bit um, more digging into the world of academics and found that um, when looking at orthopedic spine surgeons, 3.16% of them were female, which uh, drops us down even further. So uh, not great numbers out there, um, but when you're considering orthopedic resident numbers um, and the fact that it's only 15% 15 15 if you round up female, um, that kind of can give you some insight as to why this has been historically so low, but you know, definitely after this talk that I'm giving right now, I'm sure that we're going to bump those numbers way up. Uh, some of the things to consider um, why uh, doing spine. Spine has a vast spectrum of pathologies. So what does that mean? That means that you can do uh, basically total joints of the spine. You can do degen, you can do deformity, which is kind of like limb, limb correction, things like that. You can do tumor, which again is its own part of orthopedics. Um, there's tons of infection to go around. So you um, get some practice there. And then you can also go into pediatrics. Um, you can either do you know, your pediatric fellowship and then do some spine, or you can also go the spine route and do peds. Um, and the highs are high. You can make a, just like Liz was saying, um, you can make a huge impact on your patient's quality of life. While the literature would argue that it's not quite as predictable for spine as it is for joints, um, you still can take patients who are just an immense amount of pain um, and disability and just really make an impact. Um, that being said, uh, some things to consider that the lows are low. So, um, you are working every day next to the spinal cord and some of the you know named structures and um, the the risks of the surgeries that you do carry carry significant morbidity and even mortality themselves. So um, you can get really low on yourself. So that's something to think about. Um, it's also not very easy to set up as a part-time career. That could be because it's been a like, historically a male-driven field, but um, at least of the female spine surgeon mentors that I've had, uh, it has not been a problem for them to have families or have, live like full, uh, you know, happy lives. Mm -hmm. um, it's technically and mentally exhausting. Uh, I was here until 10.30 last night. I'm going to be here until about that 
you know, again tonight and, you know, you're working with your whole body and you, especially with your, with your mind and it's exhausting. So, um, you know, it's, it is something that you have to think about. And then it's a different skill set than, uh, sort of the rest of orthopedics, which most of the training you get in residency might not necessarily set you up, um, to be able to rely on that once you go on to fellowship. So it's another year of learning and, you know, feeling like you have a million thumbs and things like that. So I think, uh, those are some things to consider. Um, you have to, it's something that you just really need to be passionate about if you are going to go into it. And I think that's whether you're a, a man, man or a woman, I think it's just, it's a tough field. And so, um, it's just something to think about. As for mentors, everyone who does spine is extremely passionate about it. You, we geek out about the spine. So uh, we are all for promoting people and, you know, other spine weenies out there that we just love it. So, um, you know, you will be hard pressed to find somebody who will not go to bat for you in spine if you are, you know, excited about it. Um, as that allows us to spread our excitement, excitement and joy, and then you can continue spreading it. And it's just, we're creating like a really great network. Um, then there's also, despite the fact that there are not a ton of females, as you saw with these numbers earlier, uh, there are opportunities for both male and female mentors and sponsors, as Dr. Clack had previously mentioned. Um, right now, I'm happy to be at a program where um, the chair of the orthopedic department is both a woman and a spine surgeon. Um, and so, I mean, you can find them out there and they it, just because everyone loves spine so much, we'll really just go to bat for everyone. So, um, I wanted to show you, I'm not going to, this isn't a spine lecture. I'm not going to pimp anybody, but these are just some of the cool things that we can do. Um, you know, you'll take a patient who can't even look, uh, you know, people in the eye, they can't lift their head up to be able to just see the horizontal and you can do some, uh, fancy carpentry and get them to stand up straight. So, um, really exciting stuff. There's also a lot of, uh, kind of changes in spine. And then this is also, you know, you can have these crazy tumors that people not, might not necessarily want to touch with a 10 foot pole, but you can, it doesn't have to be a 10 foot pole. You can touch them with a navigated osteotome. So, um, there's a lot of really exciting stuff in spine and it's a great, uh, career. And I, you know, would encourage anyone who, uh, th thinks it's interesting and is passionate about it to, you know, not let anything hold you back. Um, with that, I'm going to thank you. I also have some anecdotal evidence of, um, supporting cement during pregnancy, uh, but based on our N of two, I could almost argue that it might make babies even cuter. So, um, something to think about. And, uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Lindsay Meyer, um, to, uh, she is going to be giving a, she gave a recorded presentation because she's, um, She's got at a journal club as a busy trauma fellow. So uh, Dr. Lindsay Myers, originally from Dearborn, Michigan. She uh, went to Loyola University in Chicago for her undergraduate education, and she graduated magna cum laude with a degree in biology. She then returned to the Detroit area for um, medical school at Wayne State University, where she was elected a member of the Global Humanism Honor Society. Uh, she uh, completed orthopedic surgery residency with Dr. Clagg and myself uh, at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, uh, where she served as the uh, one of she, my co-chief administrative resident uh, in her final year. So she is now um, completing or pursuing, I guess is the right word to use there, um, a fellowship in orthopedic trauma at Regions Hospital in St. Paul. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen since I apparently can't think and talk. Oh, I did. All right. Okay. Uh, talk to y'all during the panel. All right. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Lindsay Meyer, and I am currently a trauma fellow at Regions Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I apologize for having to record this in advance, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about trauma as a career for women. So why trauma? Um, for me, it was really the variety. Uh, I enjoy being able to operate on all the extremities, and I truly just love the anatomy of the pelvis and having to think in 3D uh, to fix those fractures. And then along with that comes the excitement of not knowing what will be boarded the following day, uh, which may be a good or a bad thing, depending on, you know, what you're interested in. But for me, you know, I like the challenging fractures. I like you know, again, not knowing what's coming in each fracture, although it may be 
the same extremity, the fracture pattern may be different. And, you know, each fracture is kind of like a puzzle. And, and I think that just allows us to think outside the box in terms of how we approach an injury and how we subsequently fix it. Um, so again, just as an example, you can see in this picture down here, this was actually my first case from fellowship. And it was a medial clavicle non-union with a lateral clavicle malunion. And this is actually a, a locking distal radius plate that we had used uh, for short segment fixation on this medial border. Um, and another thing that really drew me to trauma, I think is just the team structure, getting to show up to x-ray rounds every day and hang out with the attendings and the residents and all just collaborating to care for these patients is something that interested me when I was making my decision for fellowship. And then finally, you know, most of what we do in trauma is not elective. Nobody wakes up and, and says, I'm gonna fracture my femur today. Um, so I think being able to help these patients regain their function after you know, the shocking injury is, is something that's really rewarding and, and something that I enjoy about the specialty. And again, I could talk for hours about why I went into trauma and why I think you, everyone should go into trauma, but these are kind of some of the main things for me. So then in terms of applying for fellowship, these are some things that I think are worth considering, um, especially those people that are applying right now. Um, you know, the biggest thing is, do you want to be the only fellow or do you want to have co-fellows? And there's a lot of single fellow programs and there's a lot of um, kind of two fellow programs. And then you get into the, the realm of four or five fellows. And for me, I wanted to have at least one other person that was at the same level as me just to bounce ideas off of and, um, you know, just have a buddy throughout the year. And so I have one co-fellow um, and it's been great so far. And then another big thing to ask is, do you take attending call? So for me, I'm credentialed as an attending, so I can mark the patient, I can do the timeout, get the room going. And the first half of the year, we actually take call with an attending, but then starting in mid-January, I'll take attending call where I'm the, the most senior person in there um, operating and doing all the fun stuff. So uh, something to consider depending on, on what type of autonomy that you're looking for in fellowship. And then along the same lines, uh, I think something important to note is what the clinic structure is like. And I know most of us would just rather be operating all the time, but I think that having a little bit of clinic and fellowship is important just because that's when all the, you know, kind of important decisions are made regarding, you know, when do you call it a non-union and when do you take them back to the OR, um, for non-union repair versus, you know, this wound kind of looks infected. Should I wash them out? Should I put them on antibiotics? So I think having the opportunity to be in clinic a little bit throughout your fellowship year is important. And where I'm training, I actually have my own uh, fellows clinic. So there's attendings nearby if I need to bounce ideas off of them, but otherwise it's my clinic. I'm making the decisions. And I think that um, that'll really help me grow throughout the year. And then the volume and case variety, I think, is important as well. I mean, most places that have fellows have reasonably high volume, but I think there are some places that may have special areas of focus. For example, where I'm at, um, Dr. Cole is kind of the one of the leaders in fixing scapulas, and he's also kind of um, gotten into plating ribs and and kind of these lateral implosion chest wall injuries over the last handful of years. So I think if you want exposure to something that's a little bit more unique like that, um, that's one thing that you can consider. And then again, lastly, which is a little bit lower on the list, but something to look at is what types of jobs are fellows getting. So for me, I wanted um, to get into academic medicine. So I wanted to go to a place that, um, you know, has good connections and, and will be able to help me find the job that I'm looking for. So just a little bit of life um, as a trauma fellow, I'm only a few weeks in, but it's been great so far. I think oftentimes, you know, when I was made the decision to go into trauma, which was pretty early on in my residency, people would say, oh, like, you know, how are you, you know, you're not strong enough. How are you going to handle the bigger patients or reduce these tough fractures or, how, you know, you're going to be busy on call operating all the time. How are you going to have a family? And, you know, I think those are things that I just let go in one ear and out the other. I mean, I 
yeah, there, you know, your call days can be busy. You never know what's going to come in. But I think, you know, for the most part, especially now that we're, literature shows we don't have to take everything overnight anymore, the, the life is um, pretty balanced. But, you know, I just in terms of my work life balance, I recently got married within the last year and, you know, we don't have any kids yet, but plan on having them someday. And I think it'll be completely realistic. And I have female attendings that have kids and, and have no problem balancing their life and work and, and make it in time for their kids uh, school or sporting events. And then even as a fellow on my weekends off, I, this is a picture of uh, one of my uh, former co-residents, Christina, she's out here doing a rotation at the children's hospital, but we were able to go see Wicked a couple of weeks ago. So there's definitely time to do fun things. You know, you work hard and, and get to have fun as well. Um, so just kind of a, little brief insight into my day-to-day -day activities as a trauma fellow. So every morning I'm getting there, we're sitting down with the residents and the attendings and just going through x-ray rounds, seeing what cases were ahead for the day and any post-op concerns. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, half of my Monday is spent in the clinic and then the other half is my time for research. Um, so I think, you know, it's a good balance between clinic and then having time to, to do meaningful research. And then the rest of the week I'm in the OR and I'm, you know, depending on which staff I'm with on the certain day, it's a combination of hot and cold trauma. So I think, you know, you get a good variety um, with that regard. And then call schedule really isn't bad. One um, weekday a week, one weekend a month. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I have attending calls starting in January and that just replaces the, the days that I already have now, just kind of as the fellow call. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, I really enjoy the team aspect of it, and I'd like to get into academic medicine. So just being able to hang out and teach the residents and walk them through some of the um, kind of straightforward trauma cases has been uh, really rewarding. So that's just kind of trauma in a nutshell. I'm obviously biased, but I think it's the best subspecialty and definitely something that you should consider. Um, but again, if you have any questions I apologize for not being able to give this live tonight but please don't hesitate to email me and we can always set up a time to, to talk on the phone if you have any questions uh, on that note thanks and enjoy the panel All right, now we're going to hear um, from our brilliant panel of experts here, moderated by Dr. Janice Bonsu, um, who will uh, ask some important questions and hear what we have to say. Yeah, hi, everyone. So glad everyone is able to join this evening. Um, please do use the Q&A chat in the bottom of the, you know, the Zoom. Um, we have some prepared questions, but it'd be really interesting to see what you guys want to know. And we have all these wonderful ladies on the phone right now. So let's get after it. So I'm going to, I have some um, specific questions for different panelists, um, but just right before you start, just give a couple sentences, kind of introducing where you are. Um, don't give too much away about how you got there, because that might come in the question later. Um, but I think that we should start from the beginning of residency. I'm PGY2. So I was really paying attention to everything you guys were saying, Liz, and thinking about making yourself competitive for fellowship. Um, Dr. Giles, if you want to talk about a little bit, you know, doing oncology, I know that oncology is such a specific and um, competitive, a little bit research-driven fellowship. So if you have a little bit of insights about how research played a role in you getting your fellowship and how much research you're expected to do even after you match. Oh, sorry, you're muted still. Can you hear me now? Perfect, all right. Sorry, I'm running the audio off my phone. Um, so I'm coming to you from Texas. Um, I trained up in Wash U for residency. Um, I just finished my fellowship, my oncology fellowship at MD Anderson actually, and then I'm starting work next year, or next year, uh, two weeks from now. Um, at uh, University of Texas. So the question about research is a really good one for tumoring specifically. Um, I was lucky enough to have started residency with a fairly strong resume. And I guess I always thought that I'd put more out than I did during training. 
Um, but I wouldn't say my my research was particularly critical for um, for choosing an oncology or for a successful match. Um, if you have a strong research background or a strong research interest, I think that that's great, and obviously pursue it, do what you're interested in. Uh, but on the other side, on the other hand, I don't think it's critical for for matching in this field. Um, there's so many job opportunities. Not even all of the clinical um, positions available want you to be that active in research right now. Um, so there's there's plenty for both. There are plenty of uh, there's a lot of spots available that are known to be more academic and research heavy, um, and then some that you just don't need it. So um, if certainly, I would I would say it's it's important, but it's not critical. Thank you, thank you. Has anyone else had a different take on research and their fellowship match, felt that it was actually useful for them um, as far as matching went? And it's kind of a, it's a controversial topic, so we can leave it there, but I'm glad that it's a little bit more optional than it sometimes feels. Um, yeah, I think that it was, it ended up being, um, you know, more than enough to have one or two strong projects in residency, but my research wasn't in oncology. Um, to, to, during during any of my period of any of my training actually um, and it turned out just fine for me so I can speak to this a little bit too Janice if that's okay um, so this is Dr. Ponzio I am a joint replacement surgeon at the Rothman Institute and I'm the fellowship director of the South Jersey based fellowship um, and so just reviewing applications and I'm speaking from joints not oncology but Research is one of the components, and I know you're going to ask me a bit more about what we're looking for on applications, um, but I do think that it is a factor that can set your application apart as an applicant, um, because there are only so many things that are presented as part of your application. And so when I'm reviewing um, candidates for fellowship, that's just one of the things, you know, so you're right, it's not the end all be all but it is a piece of, of the puzzle and it depends a little bit on the program you're applying to um, and what the nature of that program is. So where I am is an academic center and so we're associated with an academic, academic center. So we're all doing research as attendings. And so that's kind of one of the expectations that we have when we're looking for an applicant that may fit our model, you know, um, but that may not be true everywhere as you, as you pointed out. And so I think you just have to consider sort of where you're applying and then what your career goals may be after that um, to say, well, how important might research be as that part of the application? Hey, Ali Dunham. I'm one of the current uh, Pete Ortho Fellows up at Boston Children's. We had somebody um, uh, ask the group if, uh, if anyone had prior research focus in a field other than the one they matched in and how that was discussed during the application process. Uh, I actually took a research year off um, and I did not do deeds research at all during that year. Uh, I did it mostly in trauma and ethics. So not related to orthopedic surgery really uh, at all, more like the soft sciences, if you will. Uh, and research is research to a certain extent. Um, they wanna see that you have the capability ability of following through with a project uh, and ideally a project that you created, you execute, you think critically about the world around you and the problems that are faced every day. And it's not just limited to what you're going to be doing necessarily at work next year. Um, so nobody really gets on you about having research in a diverse uh, set of topics and just choose what you want to do and run with it and have fun. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. Um, if I can add something, I definitely it's it's about showing that you can do research, but I think that there is a perception, especially in some of the, the um, people think that tumor means academics and you have to publish a lot and do a lot of basic science. And I, I'd like to say that's not necessarily true. So if you're considering it, you do need to do research, you got to show that you can that you can hang, that you can publish. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in that field. I think that what Ali is saying is, is correct, that you just need to show that you're, you're capable. Absolutely. Well, while we're kind of on the topic, Dr. Ponzio, um, 
what we have you in the room, if you're able to kind of open up the chat, you know, the shades a little bit and let us know what are some of the really important factors that you're looking at um, when you get an application and what sets residents apart. And maybe even talking about how we could be really strategic in getting letters of recommendation to make sure that they are kind of what you're looking for. That sounds great. So I think, first of all, you know, as I said, there's a lot of components to the application and there are a lot of applicants, too. So there's a lot of applications that I'm reading as I'm choosing those to interview. And sometimes it's a really hard and maybe even a little bit arbitrary of decision. Um, but I'm really looking for the big picture of who you are as an applicant when I read the entire thing. And of course, I go through each different component of the application. But um, looking at your educational background, your location, maybe if there's any connections that you might have to our institution um, or to our area that make you stand out or maybe make it more appealing for you to, to come spend a year with us. Um, I think it's important to realize that as at the stage of fellowship, it's just about, about as much about being a good match for that fellowship program as vice versa. And so we're looking for a very cohesive match um, that works both ways. Research is, is, is a part of the application, of course, and like I said, for us in particular, we are looking for the fact that you've completed studies and seen them through from start to finish, um, and perhaps that you've done some posters or podium presentations um, to show us that you're going to be an active participant in our research program. Um, personal statement, you know, I think a lot of people think a lot about this, but keep it simple, keep it succinct, get to the point. I'm not going to want to read two pages worth of information, but um, sort of a, a shorter, well-written, grammatically correct essay goes a long way. Um, I find it a little bit bothersome when there's gra grammar errors, like right in the first couple sentences, you know, and so it's a sign of sort of how much thought and care you put into that personal statement, just as much as what the content is. Um, but sometimes that personal statement does set you apart a little bit if there's something interesting that you wanted to highlight about yourself, about your past, where you came from, that I think that's a great spot to do that. Um, and some of those stand out for that reason. Letters of recommendation, I think, can be challenging um, because a lot of them are very similar. So you start reading them and you see that there's sort of a form letter of recommendation and even that maybe some well-known surgeons across the country might write the exact same letter for many people. Um, so that's tough and it's sort of out of your control to some extent, but I would say that um, certainly you should try to build mentorships and sponsorships early on as a resident um, and then seek those people out for letters, um, a quality letter from somebody that really knows you to a, a better degree is more valuable um, than a letter from somebody who maybe has more notoriety in the field. Um, so I think if you can build those connections, that helps. Um, you can sort of tell when there's heartfelt um, you know, expressions about a, personal, um, a person that's a little bit more personal. And I think that, that those are things that I take note of as I'm reading them, um, and they really start to highlight some of the exceptional qualities of the applicant. And so um, that's what we're looking for in the letter of recommendations. And then the other thing is sort of your extracurriculars, who you are, your, your family, your interest. A lot of people do include those types of things somewhere on their application. Um, and really they maybe play more of a role on interview day just because they're more interesting to talk about. And we wanna know about you as a person um, beyond just you as a surgeon and as a resident. That's really, really helpful. And I guess, the one request I had, because I have some friends who are applying right now, is, and this is for all of you guys that applied to fellowship, like, how do you approach um, attendings at this point and ask them to, to write your letters and then stay on them to actually make sure that the letters get written? Yeah. What's like a really professional, nice way to do that? <laughs> I mean, I, I think hopefully most attendings are going to be pretty open to it and understanding that that's part of the process. And so I'm fine with people coming right up to me, you know, and asking me in person or even in an email. And I think a lot of people are probably more comfortable sending an email and that's perfectly fine. Um, I appreciate the reminders. So don't think that you're being a bother. I think that we are all very busy as surgeons and there's a lot of things on our to-do list. And so when I get those reminders, I'm like, 
thank God they sent me an email because otherwise I would have totally forgotten, you know? Um, so don't hesitate to do that to a reasonable degree. Um, but I think you're, it's very fair to ask them in person if you're somebody that you're, you're seeing routinely or otherwise an email. Okay. Um, I wanted to move on a little bit into, now that we're kind of, we have our essays, we have everything put together, choosing a fellowship and a really special perspective, um, Chelsea, Dr. Chelsea Brown, who also go Bucks, um, is doing two fellowship, hands and peds. And I thought it'd be really interesting for those of us considering more than one fellowship, what went into your decision-making and you know what made you choose yours? Yeah, so thanks everybody for having me. Um, so specifically it's hand and then pediatric hand. So, I mean, really it's hand. But um, <laughs> what went into my process uh, when I was choosing, I found, first off, I found it very hard to choose a fellowship. Um, I was interested in hand, sports, a little bit of trauma, and peds. Um, so that might have played into my part in some point. But I think what I really found um, was important is that I, I was really fascinated by congenital hand and just some of the pediatric conditions that they have. And I, I didn't really want to have to give that up. Um, and I, I struggled with the decision a lot. I'm sure most of you will, if you're considering a second fellowship, because it's another year of your life that you're giving away. Um, but I think some of the, the advice that I got was from some of the attendings, um, that I worked with. And really the point they stressed is there is going to be no better time in your life to do it um, rather than right now. So I know that you guys have gone through a lot of training in your, um, you know, doing one more year is kind of hard, but it's much easier to do it now than it is to do it when you're in practice. Because if you're starting a practice and then you realize, hey, I, I want to do something else. You are stopping that practice, going back, and then essentially having to rebuild a practice. And I think that is just almost impossible, um, not to mention the pay cut that you'll take that year that you um, do that. So I think if it's something that you're considering, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but I think it's really a balance of whether it's, it can work in your, in your life, um, in your timeline that you're looking at. And then what do you, whether you consider it worth it or not, um, of whether you really want to pursue that specialty. And if so, then just do it. Um, it's just one more year on top of the, you know, 20 something we've done. So it, it, it's, in my opinion, it was worth it for me, but I think it's, it's very personal. Yeah. And I, and I hate to pick back on you, uh, Erica, but I, you know, I met a lot of tumor people who then do joints additionally. So um, what went into your decision to pick one? Well, that's a good question. I, I struggled with that too. Um, I kind of went through a similar process that, that Chelsea did and that I found myself liking two or three different things. And um, sort of at the end of the day, um, I found myself between trauma, which I really like, and joints, which I really like, and tumor. And um, it came down to... Um, you know, I knew I wanted to do tumor no matter what. Um, a lot of people nowadays will double board in um, tumor and peace is common, tumor and hand is common, tumor and joints is common, and then uh, tumor and spine is also common. Um, I talked to one of my mentors a little bit about this as well. And um, I think it really comes down to thinking about certainly in, in my field, like what, what I wanted my practice to be, and then how comfortable I was at the end of residency with some of the skills in the other fields. Um, and I was lucky enough that we get really good primary joints training where I was from. Um, and I just didn't feel like I wanted to do another year of it um, to, to specialize in it because I didn't want my, my practice to be joints. I wanted my practice to be oncology. Um, and if I'm asked to do a total knee, I'm comfortable doing that, but I didn't want it to be the, the major component of it. Um, so it didn't feel like it was worth it to me to do another year, but certainly if I wanted to have a very subspecialized practice like Chelsea is doing with the congenital hand, um, certainly that's something that, that awards these fellowships, or if I think that, that oncology and spine is now becoming a, a common um, practice as well to, to do both of those. So, um, 
I guess at the end of the day, it didn't make sense uh, time-wise. It didn't make sense financially for me. And um, I just thinking about the skills that I comfortably brought to the table surgically, I just didn't feel like I needed to, to do another year um, to practice safely and to practice what I wanted to do. Um, so I decided not to. <laughs> That's really helpful. Does anyone else have any opinions on, you know, what went into their decision making? I was going to say one thing, um, just to piggyback off of that a little bit. My name is Ariana Janakis. I apologize. I have a pretty nasty sinus infection I'm recovering from, so I'm a little bit nasal and scratchy, but I'm really happy to be part of this. This has been really great, and it's making me want to do spine trauma and uh, an arthroplasty now, so now I'm rethinking all my life decisions, but I, uh, I just finished my foot and ankle surgery fellowship in Boston at Harvard Mass General, and I actually am doing a second fellowship, but it's a six-month international travel fellowship. And that's in uh, foot and ankle sports medicine and Iona, which is in office needle arthroscopy procedures. So that's hosted at NYU, but I'm actually going to spend time going back and forth between the US and Europe for six months. Um, so part of my decision to pursue that was uh, I went through all of the different feelings of do I want to do a whole nother year of something, you know, financially we're getting older and you see all of your friends being able to live a life that you sort of want and you're in a lot of debt and so you know getting your career started is obviously something we all want to do. Um, but if you want to specialize in something more and further your training, you know, for me, I wanted to learn from some really amazing mentors, both in Europe and the US, I wanted to have more of a sports based practice. And so that really solidified my decision to do another fellowship. But what I wanted to just put out there is that sometimes these are things you should pursue that are not in your traditional route of doing a full year. So I, I had to do a little bit of research, knowing that I wanted to do this international component to see, you know, are these things offered already? Are there grants you can get from different, you know, companies like you know, Stryker, Arthrex, Smith and Nephew, sometimes they can, you can apply for something and it could be put toward um, an education route. Um, or if you have some really great mentors who are well connected, they also may be able to help connect you with people um, who know of these types of educational training programs. So um, sometimes just doing a little extra legwork and going off the beaten path is something that might be something of interest to you. So just wanted to throw that out there as a, as a different path to doing a second mini fellowship. Yeah, that yeah, is yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That that actually is what one of my mentors chose to do is she did a, a three month mini joint fellowship. And um, she was the one that explained to me that um, it's hard to switch your thinking from when you're applying into residency to applying into fellowship. In residency, it's very you go to medical school and then you do residency and, and so forth. Fellowship is a little bit more choose your own adventure. So you can do you can really build your own training. You kind of have to look at what do I want to do and where am I lacking and make a judgment call about, you know, what training you need to get there. Um, so doing these mini fellowships, there's tons of them. You just have to like, like um, Ariana said, you just kind of have to do a little bit more legwork in that, but it's, it's possible. So and anyway, I'm just going to speak to that too, because I actually looked into another fellowship in New Zealand, um, which is six months in pediatrics. So um, just like when you're looking at it, I, I do think a, um, like in a, a U.S. fellowship is, is very helpful to start, but then if you are interested in travel, there are a lot of opportunities internationally. Um, my co-fellow is doing one next year in Australia. Um, I looked into one in New Zealand. So there's a lot of established fellowships out there that you can apply to and do. So it might be easier to kind of swallow that pill of doing another year if you're doing it somewhere awesome. So just keep in mind that there are those out there. I should also mention here that if you go into spine, you can do trauma, tumor, infection, <laughs> deformity. There's even some sports people are doing endoscopic decompression. You get a little oh, camera in there. So, I mean, you don't, you could just do the one fellowship. It's just but, so, I'm gonna throw that out there. Well, the problem is it's not in New Zealand, so <laughs> it could be. <laughs> but, I'm sure they have a spine. <laughs> but all, jo all joking aside, it's the same thing. Like even if you go to, you say you pick your fellowship and you um, maybe didn't necessarily get as much exposure during fellowship to something that you want to have in your practice. These mini, mini fellowships can be used if there's something you just don't feel as comfortable with. And you can often like 
use the connections that you make in your fellowship to say like for instance for spines like say i wanted to do more mis like i could go do a mini fellowship or you can do a bunch of courses or things like that so um you know the connections that you make in fellowship and your residency will kind of help help you open those doors and figure out um you know what exactly you want to do with your um future yeah i feel like i have not heard of this mini fellowship thing and be really interesting yeah. Um, and the mini uh, fellowships, like they can be anywhere from like a couple weeks to like a year. So you say, um, so for like hand practice or like elbow, like there's some really renowned elbow surgeons who all they do is elbow arthroplasty. You can literally go spend like four weeks with them. You may not get paid, but once you get within this subspecialty world, people understand that you need more training in specific areas and they want to do that for you. So you can go and shadow someone for three weeks if you want more experience. So just know that there's like these unofficial ones as well. It's like the best kept secret of training. Yeah. Secrets. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so choosing a fellowship is one thing. And like Dr. Ponzi has said, then you're left with some of the other things that make a fellowship a good match, like how far you're willing to travel, what's bringing you there. And I wanted to ask, uh, Leanne, just cause I know you came all the way from California after med school. Um, if you could share a little bit about what made your decision choosing a fellowship and how to go about finding this good fit and which institutions to apply to. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm Leanne. I'm uh, currently doing a fellowship in sports at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and as was brought up, I um, did my med school training in California. I actually grew up in California, did undergrad med school there, and then went to Penn for residency. Um, so I the jump across the country wasn't as exciting as it may Um originally sound. So I was actually born in New Jersey. So I still had some family on the East coast and I wanted to keep my options open in med school, uh, applying to residency and did a visiting sub I at Penn and loved it and ended up there. Um, and so, uh, I got, uh, enamored with the East coast, I guess, and have just stayed. Um, but one of the things that was really, big for me in terms of trying to figure out where to go to fellowship is, um, and particularly I think uh, for most of us who are on here right now uh, on the panel, we uh, were part of the COVID interview time. And so I think a lot of it really took some digging into figuring out where we would want to do uh, our fellowships potentially and trying to get information about it because we couldn't actually visit it in person. So. I took as many opportunities as I could to talk to the current fellows at uh, various uh, institutions to see if, you know, if they liked it, what were the things that they liked, um, things that they didn't, to see if it would kind of fit into what I was looking for. Um, and then also reaching out to the uh, mentors at uh, my residency, not just to see what, you know, they recommended in terms of things that they knew about different places, but if they had any connections with people who had been there recently um, for fellowship. And uh, I got a lot of contacts because if you have a new young faculty member at your residency, they may have some friends from their residency that, uh, you know, went to that fellowship. And so there's a bunch, it's a really small field. And so there's a bunch of uh, ways you can get connections and reach out to people and most of the time people are very willing to take that cold call or cold email and answer your questions. And so it, it takes a little bit more research and, and digging and really kind of knowing what you're looking for in terms of um, a training uh, institution, but it's, uh, it's definitely worth it to try to get some um, ideas about, you know, how other people uh experience their time there and, and what they liked and what they didn't. Yeah. And I, Liz, I love that spreadsheet that you shared, you know, little snapshot you shared. Uh, Leanne, did you have any, Thank what you. was your way of like record keeping to keep all this straight, all your priorities straight? Yeah, I had a, um, I had a spreadsheet as well of all the different places uh, that I was looking into. And I even got so crazy to start like a little scoring system. And so like research was something that was really important to me. I'm hoping to have a 
surgeon scientist career and maybe do a, up to like 50% of my time being research in my career. And so uh, finding a place that would value that or help me make networking connections in that way was important. Um, so that would get a certain point in my <laughs> Excel sheet. Uh, the feel of the interview day, um, if I thought that they were going to be good mentors, if it felt like it was a good fit, and then, you know, various other uh, things. But the Excel sheet is definitely a nice way to kind of try to organize all those things because you think you will remember it when you go back to make your rank list. And then you're like, ah, they all seem so similar, so great. So it's helpful to have those notes there that you can reference. Gotcha. I've, uh, you know, I, I live on Instagram. So there's um, these people who are making like planners, you know, and you can just get planners. I, I wonder if RJOS or um, any of our partners can make a scoring sheet that's really helpful to help template this for um, people as they start to go through this. I know everything is so personal dependent, but this would be a really helpful tool to be a template for people. That's a great idea. Let's make it. We'll yeah. make it. We're Not make done. it. <laughs> Coming soon to the website near you. We'll make a, that was a template. I, love I think. It. Um, you all attending this are already a step ahead. You know, I, I remember going into this process and I was a couple years behind all of you or ahead of you, all of you doing this, but um, not really knowing what to look for in a fellowship. And until I really started going on interviews, then I started realizing, oh, there are differences and these are the things I need to be looking at. Um, but I think interview really interview day really told me a lot about programs and about the individuals I would be working with in a given fellowship. Um, so there's maybe a different perspective from some of you who had to do virtual interviews, you know, and how you managed that, um, because I think that those are still going to be in existence going forward. Um, in one way, it was easier to cut down maybe on travel and travel expense and um, time away from residency, but it does become a little bit more challenging, challenging I think, to get those one-on-one -on -one interactions um, and to actually see an actual physical place where you would be living and working. So um, maybe somebody can comment on that. The other thing, um, there were a couple questions up about um, letters of recommendation. If you are looking for a letter from somebody that maybe you did a research year with, I think that's perfectly fine, but you should have another letter there that's gonna be from a clinical perspective. If I see all letters that are very research heavy, then I think as a, as a fellowship director, I'm thinking that this person maybe is really heavily interested in research and therefore maybe our clinical clinically driven practice is not really the place that they are looking to end up, you know? So I think the message that you send through your letters um, can be affected in that way. Another question was um, whether your, um, you know, your letters have to come from people that the fellowship director knows, and the answer is no, it could be anybody. I think a strong letter goes a long way um, from somebody that knows you more personal, personally. Are there any other questions that were directed towards me, Janice, that you saw? Um, no, not that I've seen, but I, I just was keeping my eye on the clock and I wanted to kind of fast forward us to the end of um, the whole application thing. It's life after fellowship, right? The point of this all is to get a really um, successful and enriching job. And now that I know all these things about many fellowships, the timelines are different. Mm -hmm. um, I'll pose this to Ariana, but anyone can jump in. You know, how important and where do you start this networking to find a place to land after fellowship? And what are some important factors or spreadsheets that you're using now? <laughs> Um, well, I love that everyone's doing the spreadsheet. I wish I was better at that. Back a couple of years ago when I was applying, I remember one of my friends, she was applying foot and ankle too, and she was really good. And I, I, uh, I was not as uh, organized, which I'm so happy to hear that people are, because I think it's really important to do that. But I think that, um, especially since we have a lot of residents on the call, um, something I learned is starting early is always, you know, helpful. I think being on this call, number one, and having this is really, you're already making progress and going in the right direction. Uh, I knew I was interested in foot and ankle. So at AOFAS, they do have, you know, mentorship pairing where you can get a mentor and a mentee. And, and if they have that in your societies, I think that's really great. But I met a lot of people who are leaders in the field at the different events. So at the AOF, AOFAS conference, the AOS conference, and 
what I had done because I knew I wanted to be more academic, I actually linked up with some of the attendings of the programs I wanted to go to and started doing some research projects with them remotely. Um, so I already had a good relationship with a couple of the foot and ankle uh, faculty members at some of the places I was applying. Um, one thing I also did that was a little bit non-traditional was earlier on, probably in my third year, um, I took some of my vacation days to spend some time at programs I was really interested in. Um, so you can go and ask to just shadow. I didn't get scrubbing privileges or anything, but I knew that there was certain select programs I really wanted to train at. Um, and so I ended up taking my vacation time and spending a week or a couple days just so that they could get to know me. Um, and for me to get to know the program, which I think it's important because then you get a really good feel of the program and the environment. Um, one year, you know, you can live and work anywhere for a year, but you want it to be a great year. And I think that fellowship is more like an apprenticeship where, you know, you are going to be interacting with attendings more than you would normally in residency. And you want to be able to go in and have a great relationship with them so that when you leave there, you're able to call with questions and have good rapport with them continue having you know meetings you know dinners at the meetings uh you know for alumni events um so i think starting early is really important um in order to navigate you know when you're applying to different fellowships and then you know for me i ended up just so i'll be starting an attending position at yale in april so i was interviewing i was getting my second fellowship organized and then interviewing for a job and finding a fellowship that um you when you talk to the fellows that are there but that are supportive of you taking time to interview and um you know supporting you in writing letters for you because they're going to also be important in making those phone calls for your first job too um so you want to be able to trust those people you're working with um so you know i think just putting yourself out there and one of the things i've learned is that the worst case scenario is someone can say no so ask and try to go after everything because um you know all it takes is a yes for you to get involved in a research project, get involved at, you know, a meeting or whatever it may be that you're looking for. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people just got new jobs too. Does anyone else have any good advice or perspective to share on this? Awesome, awesome, because I, you know, a lot of people, I didn't realize how much of residency and I guess fellowship is really deciding how to curate, you know, you're, like you're curating it all yourself, like you said, choose your own adventure. So having this advice is incredibly useful so that now I know, <laughs> now I'm going to start emailing people and doing things. Um, but thank you guys all so much for all of your perspectives this evening. Um, if there are more questions that come along, um, just I think there is an email for our jail. I hope there's some place we can funnel it. Um, some speakers share their email addresses, but look forward to some of these events that we host with RJOS and all of our partners. Um, we try to make it really relevant to what the residents and fellows and you know early attendings are kind of going through. And um, thanks for joining. Yes, thanks for sticking around. Please, this is a plug, reach out, join RJOS if you're not already a member. We have scholarships for residents and medical students to attend the annual meeting, which is part of the AOS annual meeting in, in the spring. And then also, um, if you're interested in adult recon, please uh, reach out and be an AUKUS member, reach out to WIA. Um, and thank you to all our amazing panelists um, and moderators. And yeah, thanks to everyone for hanging out. Oh, and they'll be recording for everyone. If you have friends who are on call or something like that, um, this recording will be available um, on the AUKUS website and I believe on the RJOS website as well. So spread the word and you should be able to watch it later too. All right, thank you everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you.